So I'll just start the lecture. Right? So as I said earlier, this is <clears throat> the introduction part of Cocos, uh, and just specifically targeted to people uh, who have probably only heard about Cocos, have never tried it. Uh, so we explain in detail individual concepts, uh, what we are doing, why we are doing some things, and how and, and why we think this is a much better uh, option for you, especially if you're looking for something like a performance supportable framework. Right. Uh, so what do we want you to think about Coco? Like, what do you want to, you to think when you think about Coco? We want you to think that it's a single source implementation that uses C++, right? We want you to think that it's a descriptive programming model, which means that you get as much um, freedom to express parallelism in your code uh, and but how that parallelism is going to be mapped on the underlying hardware that right is reserved in Cocos. We'll talk a bit more about this in the upcoming slides. And the idea is that you write one source file uh, in C++ using Cocos, and then you, it should be fine uh, for you to compile it on CPUs and GPUs without needing to change anything. Uh, if you use like uh, accurate Cocos semantics, the project has been around for a while. Uh, it, it originally uh, came out of Sandia uh, almost more than 10 years ago, uh, but later on, especially during the ECP era, it got uh, other labs joined in in the effort. The, right now, there are like five different DOE labs that are contributing to the effort and other institutions. Like there was a recent, we recently started collaborating with the French DOE, I think it's called the CAA. It's also now part of the Linux Foundation. So there is a, a guarantee that you know the project will have a long term uh, support and development. There are already more than hundreds of projects that use Cocos, so the number of users are also more than that. Uh, the you you don't need some sort of a, like an obsolete uh, compiler or some software stack to get Cocos working. Any any basic like a GCC compiler or Slang compiler going as far back as like version eight or something like GCC now is a 12.3 or 12.4. We, we test regularly Cocos with uh, GCC 8 upwards. So any uh, widely used compiler stack, can uh, you can use that to start getting your work on Cocos. I, I want to um, stress this, that what we are presenting in this training is actually a condensed form of lecture series that is already available online. Uh, those the links for those are already given in Helen's uh, introductory talk, and also I, I'll, I'll again uh, re-show you the links uh, later in the slides. But this is a part of a much longer lecture series that was done, uh, as you can see in the slide here. That there are eight modules in that series. Uh, each of the module is designed to last an entire day. So compared to that timeline, we have like two, three hour sessions. So we have condensed a lot and we cannot get through almost everything uh, here. So the idea of this training is that you get enough of an understanding of Cocos that you can go back and, and start looking at the lecture series, uh, which are much detailed and from, you know, Christian Trot, so who's much better at explaining things than I am, let's say. Um, and you have enough background that you can understand that at a much but uh, deeper level. The uh, the training right now is going to be like intermixed with uh, some small exercises. They're not big exercises, just small exercises that most of the code is already there. You, uh, you just have to make like small modifications to understand the concepts better. At least I myself understand things better if I do some hands-on. So we thought we will keep that component in during the training. And you don't really need GPUs, but CPU should be fine. But I think all of you should have uh, accounts on Perlmutter, which has the Cocos modules. So you should be able to even try GPUs if you want that, if you want to try that. Now let's start with some basic introductions. Right? Okay, uh, before I go ahead, I want to uh, I want to say that if there is something that you want to ask, uh, please don't hesitate to like you know raise your hand or something. Uh, we, we somebody is answering the questions that are on the chat, but I will not be able to look at it until I finish the talking. So, uh, oh yeah, somebody raised a hand. Igor, can you 
So I, I would just uh, want to ask if you can talk relatively early on what are the limitations of interfacing with existing relatively complex C++ codes. Uh, I know uh, this is introductory and we'll do mostly from scratch, but most people don't start, start from scratch. So getting some feel early on on what uh, can we expect uh, when we try to port or interface with existing C++ codes would be nice. Right, sure. I mean, I don't have some slides specific for that, but uh, I'll try and uh, focus on that when, when I come to that point. Yeah, okay. So uh, in the introduction session, uh, what do we uh, what do we plan to cover? Uh, basic, you know, basic introduction of what is Cocos and why we think, you know, it will be great for you to use it uh, if it suits your needs. Then something about parallel uh, patterns, like simple parallel patterns to begin with, like parallel for and reduce, uh, and how we view uh, such things. What are the components involved in that? Okay, so why do we need something like Cocos, right? Uh, this is slightly older slide, but I think it makes the point that we're uh, uh, as to why there is some, a need for something like Cocos. If you see here, right, right within the DOE space, there are systems with variety of hardware. Like at NERSC, we have NVIDIA GPUs, so you need CUDA to program them. Uh, you have AMD GPUs on Frontier, so you need HIP, and you have uh, Intel GPUs on Aurora, so you need uh, SQL or DPC++. And apart from that, there are CPU machines just on NERS. We have like a separate uh, CPU nodes, which have no GPU. So you would use something like OpenMP, uh, which is quite mature for CPUs, right? Uh, but there is no single framework that, that targets all, all the hardware uh, that we see. They, well, potentially there is OpenMP, uh, whose training is also coming up pretty soon. The, the problem with OpenMP is that it is provided by multiple compilers. So, and each of them would probably try and optimize it for their own hardware. Uh, the nobody implements the entire OpenMP5, which is targeted towards GPU, right? They all implement like subsets of OpenMP5. So sometimes these subsets don't intersect, and sometimes even if they intersect, the interpretations of what a directive should do on a particular hardware differ. Uh, so it's not exactly uh, at a place, especially for C C++ codes. Uh, to be adopted in for like major projects. So potentially if you want to write like a portable code that works on all three GPUs plus CPU, you potentially need to have like four uh, versions, each of them using their own you know framework. And there's a cost associated with it, right? So an industry estimate is says that for a software engineer who does nothing else but just writes code, will probably write like 10 lines of production code every hour, which extrapolates to like 20,000 lines of code per year. And a conservative estimate says that if you want to switch programming models in an app, you need to at least rewrite like 10% of it. Some, most of the time it might be more than that. Uh, but combine this with the fact that most of the projects just within the DOE space use you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of code. And like for bigger apps like E3SM or Trillinos, there are like millions of lines of code. So this would mean that just to switch programming models, you would end up spending multiple person years per app. And this estimate is based on, you know, someone just writing software code and does not do any other thing. Uh, or does not uh, have any other responsibilities. And this is a lot of cost that we probably, all software teams might not have, right? all application teams might not have. So obviously we think Cocos is the best solution for it. So what is Cocos? In a, in a nutshell, it is just a C++ programming model for portability. It is implemented like a templated library on top of CUDA, HIP, and OpenMP. So underneath, you will get the, the vendor preferred programming model uh, to run on the hardware that you're running on. Uh, the top layer is Cocos, right? It aims to be descriptive and not prescriptive. What I mean is that you, Cocos gives you all the ability and constructs to, uh, to 
express parallelism in your code, but how that parallelism is going to be mapped in on the underlying hardware is uh, that right is re retained by purpose. And it aligns its development in the C++ standard. What, what that means is that a lot of Cocos features that we think are useful for uh, developers and which have been used by the developers at a very uh, at a very large scale, we try and push them into the C++ standard. There are successful examples for it, like the Atomic Revs or the recently approved MD span in C++ 23, I think, uh, which uh, which is mainly based out of Cocos views, uh, which Bruno is going to talk about after this. Uh, so and there are like a, a approximately like 10 or more than 10 Cocos members, uh, current and former, who are in the C++ standard committee who are working towards these, uh, these efforts. And one thing that you need pretty soon, as soon as you start writing uh, any software application is the use of like, you know, matrix multiply or something like that, like a MAT library kernel or like linear algebra kernel. So Cocos has an entire ecosystem that designed to address all these needs. So there are Cocos kernels uh, to provide support for math and linear algebra kernels, which is written on top of the basic Cocos core framework. So the integration is, is uh, very good. There are tools that you can use to debug and profile your code. We are also working on providing integration with like CodePrun and, and, and Python codes. So there's a there's an entire ecosystem that is that is designed to to use Cocos for your software apps, right? And we try and address as much as many things as possible that you would might need to you know develop like large scale uh, software applications. It's an open source project, right? It has a very uh, has a big community. Like main uh, this is the main repo. You can go to GitHub.com/Cocos. It might change. I think once we join Linux Foundation, I don't know when that is going to happen though. Uh, but of course, uh, it will be notified quite a lot. And there are hundreds of users. I mean, just on the general channel, I think there are quite a lot of users. If you join Coco Slack and you look at the general channel, you'll, you'll see that. Uh, right, for what do we, uh, what do we think uh, you would need for this tutorial. First is because it is a C++ based uh, programming framework, we hope that you have some uh, um, knowledge about simple things in C++, like you know class constructors, member variables, uh, operators and functions, uh, member functions and so on. Uh, as mentioned earlier, Cocos does not need an obsolete software stack. You can do, you know, you, you can start working with it with like as low as GCC 8.2. You obviously need Git because you want to clone the repos and things. And the rest of the uh, uh, information here is pretty much the same what Helen presented about where you would find different uh, um, uh, information within the Cocos uh, GitHub space. Uh, like you can find these the current slides that I'm uh, that I'm presenting. You can even you can find the exercise that we'll we'll go on and and do uh, and hopefully try a bit later. Right. Again, the same online resources a bit more. Uh, I, I would encourage you to join Coco Slack, specifically the DOE portability training channel. Uh, there are other Coco team members in the channel who, who can answer your questions, um, even post the training session, right? Uh, and even if those, uh, even if you ask them now, like uh, there are other people there who are not in the training, so they can answer you. Right. What do we hope that you get get out of this training, right? Like I said earlier, it's it's not possible to cover all of Coco's features within within the given uh, timeline. So for the new user training, we are trying to focus more on the Coco's basic capabilities, like simple one D parallel patterns, uh, deciding how and where your code will run and where the data would be. Uh, that's the Coco's views and memory spaces that will come after this talk. Uh, how would you manage data access patterns for performance portability, not just portability? Uh, some more of multidimensional data parallelism, you know, for nested nested loops. And from the advanced capabilities, we hope we can get through the hierarchical parallelism, uh, which uh, which is the which is the next level after multidimensional parallelism that you might want to use if you're using GPUs. Uh, 
right? So what do we hope that you take away from, from this tutorial? It is that you, I hope, and we all hope that you, you understand that you can write a single source portable code in C++ using Cocos. And for most part, simple things will stay simple, right? It's not really that much more complicated than let's say OpenMP. Uh, we believe that some of the advanced optimization capabilities are much easier to express in Cocos than like the native frameworks like CUDA or HIP. Uh, the Cocos abstractions for uh, data are probably one of the only ones uh, that you will not find in any other framework. Something like that will not be available in any other framework as far as I know. Uh, and controlling data access pattern is key to getting uh, performance, right? You will get portability. The issue is always about performance portability. And like using Coco's data abstractions is the key to, to reach there, right? The ecosystem comes with a lot of other things, right? There are tools, there are math libraries and kernels that you can use uh, for your advanced uh, operations. Right. Some things that we hope that you all are aware of is uh, are, are some things that we hope, assume that, that, that you are here because you want to use all of HPC node architectures, right? Like typical node is now like multi-core plus accelerator. So you want to use all of that parallelism within an HPC node. You are familiar with C++. Uh, I know some of you might be more than some others, but you, because it is a C++ based uh, library, some amount of C++ uh, knowledge would be great. Otherwise, the concepts might be difficult to follow. You want to make GPU programming easier. Right? I mean, easier is, is a relative term here. I mean, simple things will stay simple, but if you want more uh, advanced concepts, of course, you have to put in the effort. Uh, and you would like portability as long as it doesn't hurt performance, right? Like Cocos's claim is that it is performance portable, not just portable. Right? Some things that that might help you in understanding the lecture series better is how data parallelism works, some amount of familiarity with opening P and GPU architecture specifically. That would be great because then you understand why some things are being done uh, way before we, we explain the entire context. No. Um, now let's look at like a typical target machine that you want to talk. Uh, like let's say you have this kind of a node structure, right? We have multi cores each, and some of those cores are distributed within different numa domains. There is an accelerator or multiple accelerators attached to the to the cores uh, with its own package, like on package memory. The cores might themselves have some of the on package memory. And then these there are like other network links to like DRAM and like external nodes and other things. So this is like a typical node architecture uh, that you might find uh, in most of the uh, like supercomputers or big machines right now, right? And Cocos is designed to target all the parallelism within this node. Like it can target both the CPU parallelism and GPU parallelism within the same source code. That is that is the aim. Uh, that is the uh, aim of Cocos or, and the advantage to me. So. Right. Um, is is there any are there any questions at this point? That, okay. So one thing that we want you to understand is that there is a difference between portability and performance portability. We we already I already mentioned this point a couple of times in the earlier slides. Uh, like let's say for an example, for example, like you have a CPU code that has locks in it, which is very legal, and and quite a lot of CPU codes have them, but CPUs only scale up to like let's say one twenty eight or two fifty six cores at most in in the current scenario in most cases, uh, and that works fine. Uh, locks works locks work fine in that case, but when you're talking about something like GPUs, like where there are hundreds of thousands of threads, uh, this becomes even though you can do it. It, it it's not really advisable because that's a huge bottleneck. Okay. So the goal here is to write like one implementation that can compile and run on multiple architectures, perform uh, optimized memory access across every architecture, 
and can leverage the architecture specific features whenever possible. And we, we believe that Cocos is that framework that, that will let you do all these things. Right. Uh, if there are, I'm just going to, I'm just going to pause here for, for a bit. If there are any questions you can, you can ask now. Uh, okay, so I'll go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I have one question like uh, in terms of MPI, do we need to change anything regarding Cocos or it remains same? It remains same. Like uh, Cocos is a the shared programming model on node programming model. It, uh, it has features to pass your data from Cocos to your MPI calls and that uh, there is already a lecture module for it uh, where you can get deeper understanding, but you don't have to change anything specifically for MPI. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, I just had a quick question. Uh, hello? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so can we use uh, Cocos as an open MP replacement? Or can. Yeah, you can. So there, there's a catch there. First of all, yes, you can. Uh, Cocos would ultimately map all its constructs onto OpenMP if you use if you want OpenMP underneath. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're only targeting CPU parallelism, then Cocos is probably an overkill, I would say. Mm -hmm. OpenMP itself is very mature for CPU parallelism, so you might as well just use OpenMP directly. But if you want to even target GPUs, even if it is just one GPU, uh, we believe that Cocos is the way to go about it uh, because it's much easier to write GPU code in Cocos, as I would say at least. Uh, that's a personal opinion, right? Everybody might have their own opinion. Uh, and you never know. Right? Today you're just targeting, like let's say, GPU A. Tomorrow you might also want GPU B like down the line. You are you don't. So it, it might you might as well make that uh, assumption and, and use Cocos. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, just one last question um, regarding the latest technology like MEMS. So does uh, in that also works with this or like Envish MEMS or Rock MEMS? Yes, that does work with this. Uh, we also have uh, projects called Remote Spaces, which is essentially what uh, the which essentially maps. Uh, your calls to the underlying NVSMEM or ROCHMEM or whatever OpenSMEM that is, uh, depends on what you choose. Uh, but even without using it, uh, it should, like if your MPI code uses NVSMEM, then Cocos plus MPI wouldn't use NVSMEM, let's say, right? It does not affect your uh, your network capability. This is purely like a replacement for, let's say, OpenMP or CUDA. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let me, should I, okay, I'll start now then. Uh, um, okay, some of the concepts that we want to uh, specify here or discuss here and some of the terminology that, that will help you understand uh, the, uh, the lecture series uh, in a much better way going ahead. I, I just want to introduce them here. One is the terminology of how you would just define a loop. And the other is the data layout problem, which which I think most of the data layout problem will actually come in the next uh, next talk by Bruno. Uh, but the first uh, point here is at least what we are trying to address in this talk. Okay, let's consider this simple for loop, right? It's like uh, there is a for that goes over, you know, some number of elements and does some, you know, updates. Uh, an internal variable, there, are, there is some nested loop. It's a fairly simple loop. That, that you might find uh, in quite a lot of domains. Uh, so what what how would you just how would you specify what is a pattern policy and body in this way? It's a for loop, so that is the pattern. So for each element in that loop, you do something. And how big is the loop? Like that is your policy. Like this, for example, in this case, it goes from zero to number of elements. That is your policy. And 
the body is the what is the work inside each iteration that is the body of the loop right it's it's a fairly uh, simple concept like pattern tells you like what is the structure right uh, it's a, it's either a path uh, it's a for loop it, it can be a reduction it can be a scan it can be a task plot it can be anything policy is how the computations are executed and body is something that is inside each loop right that is the unit of work that you're doing based on your uh, pattern and execution policy so you can think of it like the pattern and policy drive your computation body in some sense right now in this case it's a fairly simple like sequential loop right you, you can even say that uh, iteration i is dependent on sorry iteration i can be dependent on iteration i minus one and that will be legal in this case right uh, but it's not the case in this loop uh, but it, it will be legal if, if, it, if you're running the serial code like, but what if you want to thread this loop, right? What do you want to run this loop in parallel? So the most basic thing is you do like an open MP parallel for, right? It tells you like, okay, now I want to run the serial loop. I want to change its policy from serial to parallel. So I say OMP parallel and then the pattern, the for pattern, and then the open MP would, would then the compiler in runtime would make sure that this loop is then chunked up into like smaller, uh, smaller sets of iterations and then given to each thread and within each thread then it might be potentially just running to that chunk of iterations sequ sequentially again if you want to be if you want to go into that depth uh, and this is fairly simple uh, for all CPUs right it's pro it's supported by most of the compilers uh, on most of the hardware CPU hardware but what if you want to do this on a GPU right right uh, Three different GPUs, major GPUs that we have out there now, at least three different vendors uh, we have for GPUs. So OpenMP from its 4.5 standards onwards, and more specifically, like five and above, and OpenMP 6 is going to be released like pretty soon uh, at the end of this year. So every every standard from 5, 4.5 upwards has steadily added directives. Uh, to make GPU parallelism more uh, more efficient and more you know more constructive, uh, but of course it's not as simple as a CPU parallelism, right? You have to first say OMP target, which which means that this following part of code will now run on a GPU. You have to give some data map clauses where you want to map from C data from CPU to GPU and and the other way around. You have to in some cases for potential benefits, you might even have to, to, to give grid dimensions. Uh, uh, sometimes compiler chooses the best one for you, but if not, you might want to try with that. And then the rest of like, you know, you want to say like okay, OMP distribute, distribute a chunk of these of one loop on, on into like different teams. And then within the team, again, parallelize a different loop within the threads of a team, right? There is, more complication involved here. Just by looking at, uh, you, can, you can probably just say that looking at the directives right here. The patterns again, for some amount remain consistent. Like you say, it's a for pattern. There's a policy that's going from elements uh, to num elements, zero to num elements. There is, there is a loop body that's going in here, right? OpenACC is somewhat similar. Maybe the, it's a bit more neater than OpenMP because it was originally targeted towards GPUs and like OpenMP, which was a CPU framework first, which was later extended to add GPU directives. But it's it's again doing something very similar, right? And this would work fine, right? Like OpenMP, for example, is supported as we saw in the previous slide, is supported by different compilers for most of the hard, uh, GPU hardware. And this would be portable enough, but will it be performance portable? That's the main question, right? Like uh, on on a threaded machine, this this is fine, but uh, if you go to GPUs, will it be performance portable? Right, and that depends on the memory access pattern. The main uh, the main uh, bottleneck for any performance portable uh, code is the memory access pattern because. If you have some amount of uh, background within CPU and GPU, you will you will understand that both those architectures need different kind of memory access pattern. To uh, in one case you want to do more of uh, 
you know you want to avoid false sharing in the other case you want to do more of memory coalescing so uh, and so it's a completely different ball game in each of the case uh, and no and openmp or openacc do not provide you the capability to do this right it only provides you the capability to uh, to chunk up your code and send it to gpus in, in a specific way now let's just look relook at the earlier example and let's say we add some amount of um, um, like one more loop to it. Let's say you you go like there is an another nested loop that goes from the you know, I loop that goes to some specific vector size, and then internally you are accessing the right and left arrays, and you 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 are summing up the values that are coming up in there. Right. If you look at the indexing of the right and the left arrays, you see that it's actually uh, it's a canonical calculation of something that is a three dimensional array. Right. You're you're hand coding what you would theoretically uh, think of as a three-dimensional array, but you're hand coding that calculation of to reach that particular index in the array by hand, right? Uh, and this works great on, on CPUs. Um, you can uh, you can parallelize the outer loop and you can uh, vectorize the uh, innermost loop and it's it's great on CPUs. The, the, there is no data dependency in, in between iterations. So, you know, you can vectorize that. Uh, so, and this works great on CPU, right? But the moment you try to do the same thing on GPU, you lose you lose orders of magnitude performance, right? And key there is the memory access pattern, the thing that I've been telling you for for, for a few slides now. Uh, and this is the problem that Cocos addresses, right? Uh, for performance, the memory access pattern must depend on the architecture that you're running the code on. Now. Uh, let's go to the next section, unless somebody has any questions. Okay. So let's talk about the data parallel patterns and what we want, what we're going to talk about this during this uh, section is uh, how, how are computational bodies passed to the COCOS runtime, right? And how would those bodies map on to the underlying execution resources? We will discuss the most like basic parallel patterns in Cocos, the parallel for and parallel reduce. And then hopefully by the end, we will come uh, and you guys can try like a hands-on exercise. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's look at another simple for loop, right? It's very similar to what we saw earlier. There is a for loop, there is, there is, it goes like, you know, it, it iterates over some number of atoms and it does some, like for each of the atom, it calculates some force, right? Now, how would you map this force, this, sorry, this work, or uh, this loop uh, onto, uh, uh, how would you, how would you distribute this loop uh, up between like for the pattern policy and, and work, right? We already have everything. We have the pattern, we have the policy, we have the loop. So each, so what does Cocos do? Cocos maps each of this iteration, which we call as a unit of work on, onto the, uh, is it, it identifies that as a unit of work, and then it maps that unit of work onto the underlying hardware. And the total amount of work is defined by the policy, right? So technically what you're giving to Cocos is an iteration range. You're saying this is, the policy, this the iteration brain, the, you, you do this much amount of work. And then you give the loop, the computational body, which we can also call as kernel. And then Cocos will decide how to map that on, on the hardware. Right? That is what, that is essence of a prescriptive model. Like you express parallelism and Cocos will map that parallelism onto the underlying hardware. Now, how would you give these computational bodies, the loop, to Cocos? Well, it is done by the one of the most common patterns that we see in C++ called functors or function objects. Uh, it's a very common pattern in C++. Essentially, what it does is you have a struct, right? Uh, and inside a struct, you have uh, the operator, parenthesis operator, and your computational body that you have goes into this operator, right? This is this is uh, this is what is a functor is. You have uh, which is also called as function with data. You have a structure and you have an operator and uh, you know uh, maybe an index to index into the op 
into your data, uh, and then you have the computational body on it. This is the basic idea of a functor. Now, how would you assign the work from your the for loop that we saw into the functor, right? Well, let's so firstly what you do for cocos is you, you create a functor, right? And then you call the parallel for pattern with its policy and pass that functor. So this would internally call the operator, the functor that we saw and give work there. So in internally the functor will have the operator with the index. The index here is the you know the iteration index uh, in the for loop, let's say. And that is what each of the COCOs uh, um, execution resources would execute. Now, one uh, important point here is that COCOs does not guarantee concurrency or ordering of parallel iterations. What I mean by that is that just because you have said COCOs parallel for does not mean that uh, you know two iterations will execute in parallel. It, it depends on the underlying concurrency uh, of the machine of the framework, right? And at the same time, on the opposite end, it does not mean that the operations are uh, ordered. That means you don't have uh, you don't have a guarantee that iteration i plus one will run after iteration i, right? There is no guarantee of ordering. And if you write a code that violates these two sem uh, these two conditions, then you're not following focus semantics. Okay. Now, so if we want to map the functor, uh, the cocos uh, and the cocos concepts onto a functor for the loop that we saw earlier, like you know this for loop uh, that we saw earlier, you write a functor, then you create the operator, and then you stick the loop body inside the operator, right? And how do you calculate like the the index inside the the operator that is passed as a parameter, right? Essentially, the iteration index is passed here. Now, how would the operator have access in this structure to like you know the data that it is trying to to touch, right? Like atom forces. How would it have or like the data here? How would it have access to that? Well, the operator is inside a structure, so obviously you you have uh, you want to make the other data as data members of the structure. Right, that's the that's the easiest way to do that. So let's expand that structure. Right, let's say we have the data types that is being accessed inside the operator. We have the atom forces and the atom data, and that is what is called inside the inside the operator. Now, this is the serial loop, right, we, that we have been looking at. And how would you change this into a loop that is doing the same thing with functors, right? You would create the atom functor that we have we are showing up here, right? And then you call the uh, uh, the constructor of the functor with with the atom forces and with the, uh, with its own parameters, and then that gets assigned. And then you call like within the loop, you call the functor with the atom index, that is the index uh, of the iteration, and then that will go into the operator uh, here, and then you know it will calculate. The, the things that you you want to do in the loop body. Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, Igor. Uh, isn't the operator const? Yes, it is. So how do you uh, make changes to atom forces? Oh, right. Yeah, that's a good question. And technically, so atom forces here is the array, right? It's not the, uh, it's not a single value. It's not a stack value. Right, but you are modifying atom forces, which is part of the struct. So yeah, you you're can't... modifying the, you're not modifying the atom forces, like you're not modifying the atom forces pointer, right? You're modifying, let's say the an array index inside the atom forces. But that's an important point that you raise here, actually, uh, because we are going to get to this in a, in a while. 
Okay, we will wait. Uh, it was a, yeah, so this is how you would change the serial loop into a functor, right? Uh, into the same thing doing functor. And this is pretty much what the serial backend of Cocos does. Uh, you would, uh, yeah, you just want, you just have to, so, and this is where the C++ thing starts to kick in. This is more of a C style thing that you see in the serial loop. The functor is more of a C++ style thing. And this is where if you use something like OpenMP, the performance start to drop a bit. Uh, we have seen that, we have done some experiments. Uh, of course, the OpenMP implementations, especially the LLVM, upstream LLVM is working on things, on these things. Uh, uh, but there is a performance drop when you use lambdas, sorry, when you use functors instead of uh, like a serial, like a C style program. Now, the complete picture is here, right? You have the structure as early, uh, that we saw earlier. Then in your main loop, you call the functor, the atom with its own constructor, right? Which passes in the atom. The, the data that is that gets assigned to the values of the um, um, that gets assigned to the data members of the structure, and then the operator then does the loop, right? So you call Cocos parallel for over a number of atoms, and then call this functor, and then this number of atom loop gets chunked up, and each of the iteration is then given to the you know, to the operator, uh, the functor, and then that when that happens in parallel whenever possible. Yeah. Now, one thing we can all agree is that this is quite tedious, right? Lighting a functor and stuff. So C++ committee did understand this and it changed everything. Uh, it, it added, not changed everything, but it added something called a C++ lambdas that are available from C++ 11 that lets you do this kind of thing already, right? That, that you do, instead of a for loop, you say, you write a Lambda where you say, I have Cocos parallel for that runs over a specific number of, you know, iteration space. And then here, we'll talk about this, this is called the capture. We'll talk about this a bit uh, soon, but here is the iteration index. And instead of writing a functor right in the main, you can write this Lambda and the loop body remains exactly the same, right? Essentially, this this is not doing any magic. It is essentially like the compiler will auto generate the functor for you. It will look at what is what you're accessing inside your lambda and then create an auto generate a struct for you with those uh, with with those members uh, with those uh, like accesses as members in it. Write an operator uh, parenthesis operator. Uh, and do stick this loop body in there. So it's auto-generating it for you, but it's much easier for us to write this, right? And let compiler do the heavy lifting, right? Oh, okay, the actual, the capture semantics. This equals here is actually telling you, telling the compiler how to capture the data that is being accessed inside your operator, right? When you say equals, it actually makes a copy by value. And there are, there are other options. The most famous option is ampersand, which does a copy by reference. So it does not have any copy of, of atom forces, but it is pointing to the same, same thing uh, as, as, as what is happening before in the, in the outside the lambda, right? But for GPUs, we want this captured by value. The reason for that is, Cocos would copy, like if you're running this Lambda on GPU, Cocos would copy this Lambda onto the GPU and some of these uh, uh, variables inside that are being accessed might not be on the GPU. So, and if you give a pass by reference, then potentially those pointers are actually pointing to memory locations on the uh, host which then leads to memory violation, right? That is not, so to avoid that, we want you to copy by value, right? But be uh, be careful when you're doing a copy by value, like don't copy the entire stored vector. 
it's not stored vector inside on GPU, but like, let's say you have your own version of something like that. When you're doing a copy by value, it copies the entire thing. So you know, be careful of that. You don't want to copy like big things. You make it more pointed. Uh, so if you want to put everything together, right? Kevin, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to know, since you said it, it copies by value, I wanted to make sure that we would explicitly do a copy from host to GPU memory before we call the parallel loop, or but just by stating equal, Cocos will copy from host to memory implicitly. So Cocos would not copy memory from host to GPU. So that you have to do. You, you can use like a, a UVM space, then the underlying hardware, like, you know, the CUDA would do it, not the hardware, sorry, the CUDA uh, would do it if it's a CUDA memory space. Uh, if, like, sorry, if you're running on an NVIDIA GPU and you're using the CUDA backend, then you can use something like CUDA malloc, uh, malloc host or something like that, uh, which is the UVM. Uh, but Cocos would not do that for you. No. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yeah, Manthan. Yes. Um. Uh. You said that Cocos will not copy the data from CPU to GPU, right? It will not. Okay. Let me be. Okay. I, I think I was. I I I I I did not clarify. It will not copy the uh, heap memory. It will copy the stack memory. Um. Okay. And and if it's a heap memory that is a dynamic pointer allocated memory then uh, we need to allocate it we need to first copy it before running the code and then uh, it will execute that program using the ampersand then we can run right if there is no yeah yeah you you can but again this i'm what I'm talking about is the basic thing, right? Later on, we will replace this capture uh, semantics with what is called as focus underscore lambda. Uh, and I think Bruno is going to talk about that more and he will explain to you in much more detail what will happen in, under that uh, wrapper. Okay. Uh, I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, like uh, like all the policies uh, have to be explicitly copied to GPU, uh, but then uh, at the same time you said that like the stack memory is copied. Don't like the policies like for for loops are already in stack memory. Like policy is is. Different, right? You pa pass the policy. Like policy is just telling you what is the iteration range. So you want that iteration range here. So it's like uh, okay, like you have to have an iteration range, right? You want to tell the the underlying framework or, or whatever, like mm -hmm. how many of these things you want to execute. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't they be copied by like shouldn't they be stored in stack mem stack memory then, which will be copied eventually to GPU? Yes, but it is being like it doesn't know right. Let's for example you have n outside here. You have like something like int n equals hundred, mm -hmm. and it will copy int n equals hundred. That is different than saying that run this loop for those hundred number of times. That is different. Mm -hmm. You still have to pass the policy into the okay 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 makes sense. Your construct. okay makes sense thank you right um stay so what uh so conceptually like, like if you want to think about it right the cocos is not that much more different than something like open MP, right yes there are different things go in different Places, but like the simple things like you are seeing, like in case of OpenMP, for example, you say run this loop for n number of times and then run it in parallel and then pass the parallel, you know, whatever pattern you want to run, right? 
for Kurkokos, you do the same thing. You say parallel for, run it for like n number of times, and then you know the capture semantics and, and a bit more of like the lambda thing. But it's fairly similar to what what OpenMP or even a serial loop is doing, right? So that's what like in the earlier slide that I mentioned, like simple things still stay simple, right? Now let's consider another example, like a like a integration, right? This is a fairly like a simple, like a math class example, let's say, right? It's basically, it's going over uh, a range and then, you know, adding up some uh, like partial products within, within, within this. And then you know, it's a fairly simple loop. And then you want to parallelize this. And then you, you think, oh, how do I parallelize this? And you see there's a pattern, there's like, there is a for, there is a policy and there is a body, right? And, and you say, okay, let me do a Cocos parallel for here, right? You do Cocos parallel for, you pass the number of intervals, you stick the loop body in and the iteration index and you capture semantics. The first problem that you get here is immediately that you get a compiler error. And the reason for that is, right, that this is uh, the capture that is happening. When you do it by value, all the stack variables get captured as const, right? So you cannot change that inside your Lambda. Right. And that is what uh, we were talking about earlier, uh, Igor, like even, even the uh, operator that you saw was const, right? It, you cannot change the operator, like the stack values in, in, inside there. But you can, you can be smart, you can, you can say, you know, I, I, okay, I can't change stack, so I'll do like, you know, I'll put a pointer there, right? That is pointing to the total integral. So the pointer is, is, is a const, but the value pointed by the pointer is not const, right? And that is what I was trying to even tell you earlier, uh, that the value pointed is not const. So that you can update, right? But you will get incorrect result. And why is that? Because this is the classic case of, of race condition, right? You have two threads that might simultaneously try to update the same uh, value and both of them might be in different stages of updates. So at the end, you might lose one of the partial updates by one thread, right? So, and what is, so you don't, you are not getting the right answer. And what is the main reason for this? It's because you use the wrong pattern, right? That is a classic reduction example where you combine results from your parallel work and that is what you want to, uh, that is the pattern that you want to use. So even OpenMP has that, like for reduction, you say OMP parallel for, and then reduction, and then, you know, the reduction operation, and then wherever you want to re reduce the value to, to and then you, you do the, you do the reduction operation inside them. Sorry. And you do the same thing with even Cocos. So instead of parallel for, you now have parallel reduce. You have the iteration like the policy. You have the functor. And now you have an additional extra parameter that, that tells you where your final uh, like reduced result should be stored. Right? In case of lambdas, the, it, it takes like, and if you want to put this in the previous example that we had uh, about the integration, you, you do the same thing with OpenMP. You say, you know, parallel for reduction, uh, reduce the total integral uh, into the total integral, and then you say total integral plus equals whatever the, the, the work. For, for Cocos, the lambda would be parallel reduce. You give the number of intervals, then you have the iteration index. And then you see that the second argument is actually pointing to the thread local value uh, that needs to be updated. Not the actual value, but the thread local value. Then each of these threads will update their local value. And then Cocos would then finally sum up the entire uh, entire update and put it in the actual uh, final result, right? That is a total integral. That that will be, that is a slight extension from what you had for parallel for. For parallel for immediately after the closing parenthesis, you had a, you know, a closing bracket and a semicolon here, you extend that with a comma and say where you want the final reduced value to be. But the argument is pointing to the actual, like the value variable that is going to get updated by the thread. It is local to the thread. The Technically, you can even use total integral as the same name 
instead of value to update, it's called shadowing. But then that kind of um, does not give you the whole picture, right? It does not tell you like what's actually happening. This is actually exactly the same thing that happens even in OpenMP. So inside the parallel for reduction loop, if you if you print the address of total integral by each thread, you would say that you would see that different thread actually points to a different memory location. So the compiler is actually creating like thread local variables uh, that get partially updated by each thread, and then the total value gets combined at the at, at the end into like a final variable, right? Because OpenMP has access to the compiler, it can do that, you know, uh, silently behind uh, the programmer's back. back. Uh, and we like Cocos does not have compiler, right? It's it's relying on like the underlying like compiler and framework, so we cannot do that. Was that clear? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. So, uh, in can we then say that like Cocos doing reduction? Uh, have some like looks like a barrier, like perform some kind of barrier like OpenMP does when it performs a reduction for thread synchronization. Yes. So okay, no, Coco's parallel patterns are all mm, asynchronous. So if you want a barrier, you have to stick a Cocos fence after each of the construct, Cocos constructs. Okay, so the reduction- So the open MP, MP, so the exact, okay, to be more pedantic, the exact uh, implementation of the Cocos parallel reduce here into the first one would be a no wait at the end. Hmm. So that even there you would need a barrier and same is Cocos. Yeah, Igor. Okay. Yes, uh, some, the only uh, operation supported by reduce, or you have other options? There are other options. There is, uh, there is Cocos, there is max, min, almost every uh, operation that you can think of. Uh, everything that is supported by OpenMP will, is supported by Cocos. Right. Um, those, okay, just to be more just to clarify a bit more, it will not be like a simple plus or minus, right? Because like the default one is a plus, is a sum. But if you want like, let's say a, 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 a minus, right? Or a min, there are coco there are wrappers around those Cocos reducers called Cocos min and Cocos max. So insert, like even here, you could actually say Cocos sum and then pass total integral as its uh, template parameter. And similarly, you do Cocos, Min, Cocos Max, and so on. Um, hi, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm asking the same thing, but uh, on the slide it says it is not the final reduced value. So in CUDA, we have those reductions, for example, done by different blocks, and then we combine results from the blocks. Which steps yes. in Cocos do that here? So does it correct? Sorry, well, uh, which values? step in Cocos does that here? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So, or is it is it not mentioned? Uh... So again, okay, that is more of an implementation detail that I can tell you. Uh, like real fast, like within the block, the value to update gets you know reduced, and then for each of the block, uh, those results are combined into total integral. Like it does exactly what you would do in CUDA. You use shuffle instructions to to you know to get your final value. Uh, yeah, that's exactly the same. Okay. For that. Then, but, uh, then yeah. whatever we have in total integral is does those things. Sorry, what? Uh, whatever we have inside the total integral does those combinations. You would have compilation. Well, you would have the total value of of the partial updates that are happening in the range of number of intervals. I see. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Igor, is this from before or do you have another question? Oh, I have another question. Yeah. So in uh, OpenMP, you can have many variables in a single loop that are reduced with different uh, operators. Is it still possible to do this in, in Cocos? Yes, yes. Okay, thanks. That there is a concept called multiple reducers. We have, I think we have some slides for that. Maybe not in this, this session, but like 
I don't know if they're doing that even in the advanced. I think they're doing that in the advanced session. Uh, there is like, uh, uh, but it's fairly simple. It's a fairly straightforward like extension. You would say like, instead of having like just one Cocos Min here, you can say Cocos Min, whatever, Cocos Max, Cocos, you know, Min Max, Min Max Local, blah, blah, whatever. Right? You know, I, yeah, I can just, find it out. I just want to know if it is possible or not. Yeah, it is possible. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very like, it's as simple extension to this as you can think of. And there is no limitation to this, like how many reducers you can have in a single lambda. Any, any other questions? Okay. Now, uh, I know I'm, I'm looking at the time and I know Bruno has to follow me. So I'll, I'll try to uh, um, go through the next set of slides a bit more faster. But again, please ask questions. If it doesn't make any sense if I go fast and you don't understand anything, right? Uh, but essentially, these are the two parallel patterns that we wanted to cover for the first talk uh, and give you the basic understanding of what Cocos is actually doing underneath. We don't want anything to be hidden, right? We want you to know everything that's being done. Uh, the other concept that I want to talk about is that making, like, writing, doing some parallel work is not free, right? It has a non-negligible cost associated with it, which is the Amdahl's law, right? This is the law that it, you might have seen in other like computer science courses and stuff. Like the total time uh, that you, you spend on, on an app is the launch overhead plus the, the time taken, the product of the time taken per unit work divide, multiplied by the number of units of work divided by the concurrency, right? This is the total time for an app. So, and you want this to be, uh, like, if you want performance, uh, like, you know, good performance on a parallel app, you want your product of concurrency and the launch overhead per concurrency hardware, let's say, to be way, way less than the total amount of work that you're doing. That means, and how do we achieve that? There are two ways, right? That basically we want this, like, you know, the launch overhead and the available concurrency pretty much stays constant for a given hardware because you can't change the underlying concurrency of a hardware and you cannot change the launch overhead, right? You cannot change the, the time taken in the initial setup. That's generally more or less fixed. So you, you have to, you can only change the right-hand side of this equation which means that you either change, you increase your parallelism way, way higher, you increase the end much more than a given app, or you increase your uh, time per unit of work by like fusing different parallel operations into a single kernel. Essentially, you are reducing the launch overhead by launching less kernel, right? That's what this is trying to do. This is an older slide, but I think uh, it still makes the point because I say older slide because, you know, if you see the hardware here, it's like the, the most recent hardware here noted in this slide is like Pascal, which is like at least two generations behind what we have on Perlmutter, which is Ampere, right? But it still makes the point, right? Like to even start getting some performance benefit, like anything above one is performance benefits on a given hardware. Anything below one mm -hmm. is is that you are actually, you know, your launch overhead and your uh, other things are way more expensive than the parallelism that you're extracting from a, uh, from something. So uh, if you look at the, just the Pascal, that the green graph here, right? It needs at least thousand iterations of your, you know, of the number of intervals example that we just start, saw earlier to, to start seeing benefits of using a Pascal GPU. If you have less than thousand iterations, right? You, you are as well, you can just use CPUs instead of GPUs. Yeah, Manthan. Yeah, um, in this graph, then, would uh, Cocos would have Pascal 60? It is kind of saturating after 10 to the power 6, right? But yes. in normal CUDA, we don't see that saturation. You would see that saturation, right? You After a certain point, it doesn't matter how much work you're throwing at it because the underlying hardware can only do so many things in parallel. Well, uh, have, in my application, have I have in my application, I have gone from like ten to the power six to ten to the power nine, roughly. So, mm -hmm. I mean, didn't see that saturation. Like in Python, what I usually the, see this. What was the underlying hardware? 
so could a ampere 80 like uh, able to right. so ampere has way more uh, hardware resources right than pascal so even ampere okay. will i will guarantee you at some point it will saturate every hardware at some point will saturate because the number of un like underlying hardware resources are constant right so at after a point of time let's say you are completely utilizing a gpu for let's say 10 power whatever you said 9 let's say 10 power 12 uh, iterations you are completely utilizing the ampere gpu if you do 10 power 13 or 10 power 14 you still you can throw more work at it but there is no parallelism left on the on the hardware to to you know to to make use of it it will have to finish the first 10 power 9 iterations in parallel and then go to the rest of the iterations does that make sense Yes. I think okay. I think one its interpretation. This is the speed up compared to a doing all serial, not absolute speed up uh, as the size grows, right? Uh, okay. Yes, but even the speed up at some point will such like even okay. I know something. Okay, yeah, this is a speed up. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other thing? Yeah. Okay. The last thing that I want to say is always name your kernels. Like the first uh, parameter to any Cocos parallel pattern is a label that tells you uniquely what what you what this you know technically it is supposed to tell you uniquely what lambda or what functor you are referring to or what Cocos pattern you are referring to. Like I have seen codes like you know more mature Cocos codes use like uh, the namespace kind of uh, um kernel naming like you know my class colon colon my whatever routine colon colon my like parallel pattern one or parallel pattern two or whatever right you can name your kernel you can label your kernel anyway as long as it can be converted to stood string it's fine the the reason we ask you to do this is so that you can uh like when you're using cocos profiles and cocos tools uh instead of referring to your kernel through like some really complicated compiler generated mangled string, it will show you this kernel name, which is much more easier to identify. And with that, we go to the first exercise. Uh, it's essentially a matrix vector multiply that does you know two different matrix multiplications and then finally uh, reduces the value to a single value, finally gives you a single output. So it's basically a reduction. Uh, and the first thing that that you want to do in whenever you start cocos code is have cocos initialize and cocos finalize very similar to mpi initialize and mpi finalize to do like you know the initial necessary setups put that in the scope uh, if the you don't have to do the exercise from ground up most of it the things are already in there if you go to the exercise there are two different directives called uh, begin and solution we hope that you start with begin there are comments in the code which which tell you what to do, how to like, and why you have to do it. So you can follow those comments. Uh, it's fairly easy the first exercise, uh, especially. Um, you can optionally you can also try some new things like you know you can try like use the Cocos interface to, to change the number of threads if you're running an OpenMP. Uh, if you go ahead uh, and if you have some experience and you write the GPU code, uh, the first exercise like is as such targeted towards CPU, not GPU. For GPU, you know, we have to sit to the next talk. Uh, that's where the ex uh, that's where Bruno will explain uh, all those. But if you if you have some experience, if you write the GPU code, then you can use the device ID thing too. Right. Uh, if you don't have uh, access to the to the exercises, I can put that in the Zoom uh, chat real quick. Uh, uh, this was also like the GitHub repo is also pointed to in the initial slides by by Helen, uh, but I'll still put that in the Zoom in case you missed it. Um, yeah, I want to stop here. I mean, there are a few other slides that you can try uh, or that you can look at. Like you know, these are just asking you to try different uh, things with the exercise, which is already all this are in the comments of the exercise, and then it's basically. Okay, so you got to respond to you, uh, the things that we have not covered in this parallel production are like the minimum and maximum kind of productions and things like that. Uh, 
there is also like if you're writing a functor, you can use something called a stack dispatch. So if you have different functors trying to do different things, uh, in uh, like let's say you have three different parallel pods doing three different things, and you want to all put that in the same struct uh, instead of writing like three different structs, right? Let's say uh, you can do that using the task stack dispatch. And then it's a summary. So I, I want to stop here. Uh, because I already overshooted my time. Uh, I want to give you time to look at the exercise and maybe take a break. Um, how easy it is to um, you know, integrate in the existing C++ uh, codes. Uh, but it's fairly straightforward, right? Uh, as you can see, if it's an OpenMP code, let's say if you, if you want to first target just OpenMP, then because it's all the memory is already on CPUs, you can just your your for loops uh, can just be converted into like you know parallel pods with like simple policy uh, and that should work fine. Uh, but if 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 you're tar targeting GPUs, then you might have to. The only only issue there is that you have you want to make sure that the data that you're accessing inside your lambda or your your you know kernel is on the GPUs. So either you use um, uh, either you already have already allocated data on the device, right? Uh, in which case you can, you can directly again just use that. If, if, if that is not done yet, then you can just wait for the next lecture where you know uh, Bruno is going to talk about like how to use Coco's data structures like Coco's views, uh, which will allocate like a given data for you on, on your GPUs, depending on whether you your, ex, your, your main targeted GPU or CPU, you need to allocate the data accordingly, uh, yeah. It's, if, if if the code is already C plus plus, then it's, it's it's a very simple thing to integrate code, code into it. Well, I've, I've tried to use uh, the uh, standard C plus plus parallel four, and uh, on C plus plus uh, on CPU it's easy, yes. But uh, the moment you go to GPU, you cannot do like separate uh, compilation, cannot do memory allocations inside. Uh, uh the code inside the loop and stuff like that uh yes so... and, and that is a limitation of the underlying like cuda right it's not like a cocos limitation you cannot do that if you so you, don't, you use... don't essentially do any special magics to make that uh easier so essentially my question is uh are there any so you cannot do better than uh, C++ uh, standard par. It, it's what you say. Uh, are there any further limitations that I could do in standard par, I couldn't do in, in Cocos? Are there any further limitations that you can't do in standard par that you can do in Cocos? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, for the G, uh, GPU, yeah. It's, it's mostly the GPU problem. See, everything is easy on CPU. It's, uh, right. it's mainly the yes. GPU problem. It's right? the GPU part, and, yes. and, and at the end of that, Cocos or even st standard part is kind of limited by what like GPU allows under the, like what CUDA allows you, right? For example, like standard part is not directly writing like PTF, it's still writing CUDA. Uh, I think as far as I know, at least. Uh, so whatever limitations you have on standard on Cocos, you have on standard part too. Uh, there are a few things that you can do with Cocos that you cannot do with standard part, like for example, hierarchical parallelism you know, atomics on big data structure, uh, like changing your uh, data access patterns. You cannot do that on standard part. You can do that on right. Cocos, uh, right? That is, as far as I know, Cocos is the only one that allows you to do that, which is why it's like, we want to say that it's performance portable and not just portable, right? Uh, and so so many other things like using scratch memory, if you, if you start using hierarchical parallelism, right? Uh, and there, there are a lot of things like standard part, like if, if all that you're looking for is like a basic parallelization of for loop, uh, then standard part is great, right? Uh, but anything a bit more advanced, uh, yeah, standard part can't do with that focus scan. Right, that, that would, and um, essentially I need to go change deeper into the existing C++ code in order to use the Cocos uh, features uh, it will not help me in essentially wrap existing libraries that are not Cocos aware uh, to make it you can, any you easier. Can, right? See, anything that you can stand, do with standard part, you can do with Cocos with the same amount of ease. Like, let's say you have a library that is taking a device pointer, 
right? You can, like, if you're using Cocos, you can extract the device pointer out of a Cocos view, right, and pass that. It's just a member function call, right? Uh, or anything like that. It's like, I, I'm not sure what you're asking. Like, if you're asking that there is there are things that are easier on standard par that you think are difficult on Cocos, and I no, want to more, say that. It's more how much easier will Cocos make uh, me do the porting of an existing C, uh, CPU only C++ application onto GPU compared to just going the standard power route, which so far has right. been pretty If you're only looking at CPU, right? If you're only looking at CPU, standard power is great, OpenMP is great, right? Uh, the advantage of Cocos comes from wanting to have like one source code on GPU and CPU. Right. And that's what I mentioned even during the talk, right? If 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 your target is just CPU, no, no, then, yeah. yeah, no, no, I, that's exactly what I'm looking at it because I want to port start on 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 the GPU, and I started with uh, standard par and found a lot of problems. Uh, and right, uh, the moment you go beyond like the basic, you know, stood par loop, uh, you will you will start hitting issues where I think Cocos is great at addressing them. Okay. I'll... I mean, like, I, I, my view can, you can think of my view as being biased, obviously, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I think so. Right? I mean, like, so I, okay, coming from someone who's, who also started using Cocos by like through this like kind of trainings, uh, pre-pandemic. So I was one of the first, uh, you know, like I attended these, like one of the trainings before pandemic, I wasn't part of the Cocos team then. And, and I thought it was too complicated too, but slowly the more I learned about it, the more, more I realized that like you can introduce Cocos into your code incrementally. Like let's say you have an existing pointer to a data, right? You can make a Cocos view out of it, or you can make a pointer out of a Cocos view. Like it, it works both ways, right? Uh, so uh, and Cocos gives you a lot of these like um, these things uh, beforehand itself because you know it has supported a lot of projects like big projects like really mm -hmm. you know. G3SM, which are like way bigger, much, much bigger codes, at least the biggest ones that I have seen within the DOE space. Um, and there's a constant support from them. So there are a lot of needs that those projects have that have been that were satisfied by Cocos already. Um, yeah, if, if there is an issue, just ping on the Slack channel. General, especially the general channel in Cocos is like fairly, fairly active. Like, especially if you're like ping, like asking a question within like the working time of the of US working time, let's say, uh, 